good enough for me. Let's give it up for Jesus one good time. You may be seated. Hi. I love you. So good to see you. I'm so grateful to be here with you all. Um, seven days ago, uh, back in Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, we celebrated uh, the seventh year anniversary of Embassy City uh, by announcing uh, that we paid off the building. $2.2 million worth of debt eradicated in six months. We got the keys, keys, keys. At the same time, down here in sticky Houston, y'all got the news that y'all bought a building and you're debt free. Somebody needs to turn up. God is doing something amazing at Hope City. So yay us. We got the same energy, and it's so dope. I, I get to be a part of this relationship series, and so I just want to frame this. Uh, 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 if, if you're in a relationship, raise your hand. Now, see, everybody didn't raise their hand because everybody doesn't think they're in a relationship. So let me frame it for you so that you'll know we're all on the same page. Do you need to relate to yourself? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Y'all like, I think he's trying to trick us. I'm just going to nod both ways to see. Well, the truth is, we're, we all need to relate to ourselves Because if we can't relate to ourselves, we cannot relate to others. So again, I say, how many people are in a relationship? That should be 100% of the people now. Uh, I, I want to talk to singles. I want to talk to couples. I want to talk to people that's about to get married. I want to talk to people that's been married. I want to talk to people that's been divorced and, and looking to do it again, okay? <laughs> In Jesus' name. You're like, you know what? I messed that first thing up, but you know what? I believe God, he's going to do something great. <laughs> this next is going to be the best. I, I, I want to talk to you about something. I want to take you to the word first, and then we'll see what the Lord would say. Is that all right? Uh, Genesis chapter number three uh, verse number one, I want to read you um, <laughs> where it all fell down, okay? Uh, I want to read this uh, for some context, and then I'm going to take you one more place in Scripture, uh, and then I'll give you the title, and then we'll pray. Alert. This is going to be the most basic message you have ever heard in your life. If you take notes on messages, these points I'm going to give you, you're going to be like, <laughs> duh. But sometimes it's the no-duh stuff that you need to be reminded of the most, all right? So uh, Genesis chapter number one, starting at the first verse, here's what it says. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? First of all, how do you start a conversation like this? It's random. Of course we may eat the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're, to not, that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, at least that's the way I think he said it back. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me. 
you gave me her, and then she gave me fruit, and I ate it. That's the order. <laughs> then the Lord God asked the woman, what, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. I love Eve. She was straight to the point. I got played. I just, I'm just telling you right now. I got played. I want to take you one other place. 1 Samuel chapter number 10, verses 17 to 22. You're going to say, this is not related. Bear with me. Later, Samuel called all the people of Israel to meet before the Lord at Mizpah. And he said, this is what the Lord God, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel has declared. I brought you from Egypt and rescued you from the Egyptians and from all the nations that were oppressing you. But though I have rescued you from your misery and distress, you have rejected your God today and have said, no, we want a king instead. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by tribes and clans. So Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel before the Lord, and the tribe of Benjamin was chosen by Lot. Then he brought each family of the tribe of Benjamin before the Lord, and the family of the Matrites were chosen. And finally, Saul, son of Kish, was chosen from among them. But when they looked for him, he had disappeared. So they asked the Lord, where is he? And the Lord replied, he is hiding among the baggage. If you're taking notes on this message, uh, three words. Please write these down. Unpack your bags. That's what, I'm, that's what I want to talk to you about today. Whether you're single, in a relationship, you're trying to relate to yourself or others, put it in first person. Unpack my bags. That way you won't take these notes and be like, girl, I got something to share with you. <laughs> the Lord spoke to me about you today. No, 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 no. <laughs> he talking to you. Bow your heads. Let's pray over the word before we get started, shall we? Holy Spirit, help us unpack. Amen. I pray quick. I do. I pray quick. I know I just made all the intercessors mad. Y'all like, mm -hmm. there's got to be more. There's got to be more. I'm, I'm just the one you went over for Thanksgiving dinner. I'll, we'll eat it while it's hot. Uh, I, I had to give you context uh, in Genesis, and I, and I read the, the context in 1 Samuel uh, only to get to the baggage part. Uh, I hope I'm not uh, frustrating any theologians in the room uh, by this stitch. But, but there's, there's something that is incredibly important about both narratives. Uh, Adam and Eve have this beautiful relationship with God and each other. And uh, because of a serpent, Wedging his way between them, he is able to isolate them and get them to start processing outside of each other. Eve has this conversation with Adam that she does not even bring. I mean, she has this conversation with the serpent that she does not even bring back to Adam. Adam have a, has a conversation with Eve that he doesn't even bring back to God. And as a result, they find themselves having a revelation they should have never have had. Do you know you were never supposed to know the difference between good and evil? We were simply built to know God. Good is a digression from God. It's one oh too many. We are not supposed to know good and evil. We're just supposed to know God and his righteousness. But after the fall, human behavior changed in an instant. God comes walking through the garden and he talks to Adam and he asks Adam a very straightforward question. Where are you? This is literally your indication that God is a therapist. This should be your indication, your indication that God is literally a counselor. 
Because the first question that's asked by God to a human in all of history is a counseling question. Do you know where you are? This is a self-awareness question. I am giving you the chance to tell me if you know where you are, how you are right now. Adam blew the test egregiously. Hey, Adam, where are you? I'm hiding. No, duh. This was not a geographical location. I know where you are. Do you know where you are? Why you are? Well, I hear because I was naked. Second question, who told you that? Well, that woman you gave me gave me some fruit and I ate it and that's why I'm here. He's like, you know what? You failed. He goes to Eve. Eve, what, what have you done? And Eve said, listen, I was deceived. Straight up, he smooth talked me into eating that apple. I ate it. That's why I'm here. Listen, I believe that verse right there is the reason why sin is attributed only to Adam and not Eve. Because when God asked Adam, he blame shifted. When he asked Eve, she just said straight up, I got deceived. <laughs> you know what scripture says for the rest? You can read all through scripture. All it will tell you is that Eve was deceived, Adam sinned. It should let everybody know that the full weight and brunt is on the man. Every man get ready to man up because it's going to be rough for you. <laughs> well, she had a part to play anyway. He holds you responsible because you were here first. So we've been dealing with this chronic situation of hiding and blame shifting since the beginning. The reason why I wanted to read you uh, this passage in 1 Samuel chapter number 10, because Saul does it as well in a completely different way. God in private through Samuel had told Saul that you are going to be the next king. He told him privately, Saul already knew he was king. So the pomp and circumstance of the next day when they lined them all up by tribes and then whittled them down to clans and then identified the family and then called Saul out, Saul already knew it. He wasn't surprised. But when it was time to crown him king, you know where Saul was? A man who was tall, head and shoulder above the rest, as the scriptures would say, he was hiding. Everybody had to bring their bags and he was hiding amongst the baggage. Why? He did not agree with God's selection. So he tried to hide from it. And it was an interesting thing that was there that he was hiding amongst the baggage. Adam and Eve were hiding amongst the trees. The things that they were supposed to manage, they were actually hiding behind. I need us all to know that God has called us to unpack our bags. Now, before anybody starts to try to judge whose bags are bigger in the relationship that you're in or with yourself, and I don't have a big bag and I don't have a small bag, here's what I want you to know. Everybody in here got baggage. Don't you think for one moment because you gave your life to Jesus or you're considering giving your life to Jesus that you're not going to have any bags. Do you know that when babies are born, before they leave the hospital, they already have a bag? A bag these jokers didn't even buy. You can't leave the hospital without the new human that just came into the earth. He just came in naked. She just came in naked. And guess what? They already get a bag. Take that home. This is your prize. Bye-bye. And as we grow up and live our lives, we accumulate more baggage. 
Our good experiences, our bad experiences, our traumatic situations, all the things that we've ever gone through is a collection of our baggage. And the way we relate to ourselves and others is based on how we deal with the baggage we have accumulated. So I have four points. I already warned you. These are the most basic points of all time. Deal with it. Point number one, please write this down. Bring your bags. If you are going to really be the person that God has called you to be, relating to yourself well and others, you must bring your bags. This is an admission that you actually have them. You're not that cute. You don't have it going on that well that you're going to convince anybody you don't have baggage. This has to be a self-awareness thing in the same way God asked Adam, where are you? The question I have for you today is where are your bags? Do you even know where they are? If you had to take a trip today, do you know which bag you would need to take based on the destination that you are going? You have to bring your bags. Point number two, please write this down. Unpack your bags. <laughs> I told you this was so basic. Well, I brought my bags into the relationship. They know I got bags. Everybody got bags. <laughs> Are you willing to unpack them? Or are you going to spend the rest of your life with the narrative that this just me? You know who you got with. I was like this when we met. No, no, I, I recognized in all of your beauty that you had bags. I knew you had them because we went on three dates. And by the second date, your bags was popping up and you wasn't even aware. They was a popping up behind you. I was like, oh, snap. Oh, you cute, but ooh, that's a thing. Not a big enough thing to make me not like you anymore because you real cute. But that is a thing. Just want to know if you know that that's a thing. I know people that bring their bags into the relationship will acknowledge that's my bag. But they're not willing to unpack them. That's good. That's good. Come on. The, the reason why most people aren't willing to unpack their bags is because they know what's in there. You ever had a big bag you had to take through customs? And you just, you got to your final destination and you like, just let us go. Just let us go. And then somebody's like, come here. And you're like, no, oh, no. Random check. We must check your bag. You're like, no. It's so neatly packed in there, and you just about to do this. And then when you put it in back in there, you're going to stuff it all down and try to zip it back up. I have a whole feng shui thing that I do with my bags, and you're about to mess it up. Most people don't want to unpack their bags because they know what's in there. And the reason why they packed them in the first place is because they don't want to see them. And the fact that you noticed triggers them. Ooh, I'm cooking. This ain't no shout message. This is a grow up message. You have to unpack your bags. I've been married to the love of my life, Juliet, for 23 years. My wife is beautiful inside and out, but I noticed that outside before I knew about that inside. <laughs> Juliet is five foot four and a half, half Jamaican, half Bahamian, super fine and all mine. <laughs> Ooh, that girl's mocha skin blesses my whole life. Um, when we got 
together, I had to start unpacking with her what was in my bag. Some of the stuff that I had to unpack, uh, I had to acknowledge that I'm not the one that put it there. But it's there. See, a lot of people think that, well, if I acknowledge this bag and I start talking about unpacking it, um, I'm embarrassed to say that some of the stuff that's in this bag, I did not even pack. It was just in there from my family of origin. I got this rejection issue because I didn't grow up with, with the dad, and I got, this, I, I got this deceptive issue because I had to protect myself. And so, oh, man, I, if I open, if I unzip this, you go going to run. Well, well, if it's a really loving person who's working on themselves, they'll have loads of empathy and compassion for you because they're doing the same work that you're doing. The, the only people that run from your stuff are people that don't want to deal with theirs. So I had to like, I got with, I, I got with Julia and I was like, okay, woo. Some stuff in here. You probably gonna run. But here we go. Zip. So, I got, you see this attachment issue? Yeah, that's me. So embarrassing. But what happened was, uh, 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 I was sexually traumatized when I was eight years old. This is, I'm unpacking with you right now. I was sexually traumatized when I was eight years old, and as a result, um, I couldn't tell my parents because I thought my mom and dad would kill the dude, and then my older brother was in a gang. He was going to bury the body, and then I was never going to see anybody in my family again. So I have attachment issues here. Oh, there's another one. Oh, my goodness. Uh -huh. This is abandonment. It's kind of attached to the attachment thing um, because I couldn't tell my parents. I just felt, even though I was in a loving family, I felt alone and isolated within a loving family because I couldn't share the trauma that happened to me. So there's attachment there and there's abandonment here. And I'm telling you right now, if you ever talk about leaving me, this thing gonna flare up so big. <laughs> you gonna think I done lost my entire mind. All right, there's something else in here that you need to know about lies. Yes, these lies. I started lying when I was eight years old because when I was uh, uh, abused by the guy across the street, I came home, I looked my mom in the face, she said, how was your day? I said, fine. So I started lying at a young age, not about cookies and milk and toys and transformers. It was this. So uh, I'll lie just to, just to preserve the peace. There's more. Got a little porn addiction in here. Um, embarrassed about that, but when I was 12 years old, uh, it could have been cigarettes. I guess it could have been drinking. It could have been crack. I mean, I was in L.A. could have been crack for sure. Um, <laughs> but it's porn, and so this is how I numb my pain uh, with porn and masturbation. So this, th there's that. But wait, there's more. I had to literally start unpacking all of this stuff. It was not fun. It was not easy. But I did this more for me than her. I wasn't packing, unpacking my bags because I, I just got to keep you at all costs. I didn't know if she was going to run or not. I wanted to be free. I didn't want this stuff messing with me for the rest of my life. So I'm just unpacking stuff, unpacking stuff, unpacking stuff, unpacking stuff. And I, I just want to pause and say that um, uh, she had stuff to unpack too. It's just that my, like she had like a little duffel bag. <laughs> she ain't perfect, but she just came in with like a little duffel bag like, yeah. <laughs> she was like, zip, my parents got divorced. So there may be some daddy issues in there. And let's see what else is in there. That's about it. <laughs> Gave my life to Jesus when I was nine, and that's it for me. And for me, I was like, oh, man, that's all you got? She's like, yes, where's yours? I was like, hold on, it's coming. You're... She was like, I don't, did you? And, I, and then all she heard was beep. I was like, yeah, I have a whole dump truck still full of stuff that I need to 
Anybody beside me, you like, you know what? I got an 18-wheeler coming. It's in Kansas last time. I'm tracking it. It's in Kansas. But we're going to back that thing up, and we're going to let a whole lot out of it. Now, let me say something to the dump truck people that might feel like, man, you don't have a lot of stuff, but I have a lot of stuff. I just want to be very, very clear. I have seen people. I've been doing counseling for a long, long time. Premarital, postmarital, in marital, no marital. Whatever it is. And here's what I found out. Just because you don't have something big does not mean you don't have something nuclear. I've seen people come in with a dump truck and I mean, they unpack all that stuff and they feel so light. And I've seen somebody come in with one root of bitterness. And it becomes so nuclear and toxic, it ruins every relationship they have with anybody. All because they have bitterness and unforgiveness in their heart. And the person that had like, you know, I got shot nine times. I did a prison stint. Got shanked in the lower rib. But God. And the other person's over there like, and I still hate you. And they're nuclear and bitter and alone. Hmm. Point number three, please write this down. Sort through your stuff. You've unpacked it. Now it's time to sort it. Where do I put this? And where do I put that? What, what do I do with the porn addiction? How, we, how do we manage that? We need to sort through that. H how do we deal with my abandonment issues and my attachment issues? H how do we navigate this? How are we going to start talking? We got to sort through the stuff. I remember, I come from a loud family. Like, we just talk loud. That's just, and, and your family of origin, the way you, the, when you, when you around other loud people, you, you just loud with them, and you don't know you, you loud or they loud until somebody else come over. And when somebody else comes over, they just looking like, why y'all yelling so much? And you like, we ain't even yelling. This is the way we talk. We are turned up all day, every day, like this. <laughs> Yo. then, then, you go, then you go to the quiet house. The loud person goes into the quiet house. They looking. Why y'all whispering? <laughs> We're not whispering. It's just the way we talk. Well, my wife... Uh, her, her father was incredibly abusive, hated God. Uh, uh, he, he, would, he would beat the children for watching Christian television. He beat my mother-in-law violently three times, hospitalized her twice, once within inches of her life. Notorious, notoriously angry person. Why? He never unpacked his bags, never sorted through his stuff. Let me just give you a quick, beautiful bow on that dude. He gave his life to Jesus 12 hours before he died. And he is in heaven. And that's how I know God is not petty. He waited until that dude's last 12 hours and gave him one more chance. Sure you don't want to roll with me before uh, you close your eyes forever? And that dude was like, I want in. <laughs> All of heaven was like, hey, we got him. Hey, we got him. It's beautiful. It's one of my favorite stories ever. So we got married. And, and, and he would raise his voice. And when he raised his voice, he would also raise his fist. And, and, and so my wife was very, very sensitive to decibel levels that come out your mouth. We got married. We'd have a conversation. And because I'm passionate about everything. I use my whole body to talk. <laughs> I'm from L.A. We was crumping. We were like... <laughs> doing all that. I, 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 would, I, I would be talking to her and she would be telling me something like, baby, I just don't understand like why you did that. I'm like, why I did what? And she's like... Ugh. 
she would literally like curl up like, oh, no, you're yelling. And I'm like, I ain't yelling. You're yelling. I'm not. You are. And I learned that in my relationship, I could not dismiss the experience she was having with me. I didn't have to agree with it, but I couldn't dismiss it. And I'm like, well, if she thinks I'm yelling, then I guess I'm yelling. So you know what I had to do as a part of me sorting through my stuff? I had to go find another way to communicate with her. This is what love will make you do. All that, I ain't changing. This who I am. I'm like this. You're not ready to die. And if you're not ready to do that in your relationship with your person that you say you're in love with, you're also not ready to do it for Christ. You show me somebody that's not willing to make changes for their significant other, I will show you somebody that's not willing to make changes for Christ. This the way I am. You know how you found me, Lord? I don't know why I got this whole hood thing. I know. I don't know. I'm from the hood, so that's just the way I am, right? And so I, I literally had to go find another voice to talk to my wife in when we had heated, passionate discussions. And we realized that um, as long as my voice doesn't go over this octave, she can hear me. You have no idea how much discipline <laughs> and self-control you must have in the heat of the moment. When passions are high, your amygdala is foggy. To have a lump in your throat, a burning sensation in your chest, ears as hot as the equator. And I have to say, I understand, honey. <laughs> Clearly, there's been a misunderstanding. I didn't know you wanted me to wash the dishes. <laughs> but whatever it will take for me to get back to the Garden of Eden. Consider it done. And I'd walk out the room. Put on my shoes. Walk to the garage. Get in my car. Call my best friend. Do you know exactly what this girl just tried to say to me? I had to get it out somewhere. Just don't bring that energy Just trying to help some people in here. Trying to put y'all up on game. Point number four, write this down. Sort through your stuff. Put away your stuff. Put that stuff away. Categorize it, file it, and put it away. Now, putting it away doesn't mean you're not going to see it anymore. You just know where you put it. Uh, I have uh, two God sisters that swear that I am a serial killer. Uh, and Because this is the comment they make. They're like, anybody that takes any trip for any length of time comes straight home and unpacks their bags and puts stuff away as soon as they get home, they are serial killers. My retort was, I prefer contract killer. I... <laughs> Serial killer just sounds completely with no discretion. Contract, you must have done something. Or why would I be here? But I, I, I'm the type of person that when I get home, I immediately pack my bag. I got here yesterday. I completely unpacked my bag. Hung everything up. Put my shoes. I have a whole order. I am... I put everything away. That way, when I put it back in the bag, I know I'm not leaving anything out because I'm not just blindly pulling stuff out and putting it over here. And Oh, my goodness, I forgot that note. Damn. 
put your stuff away. I know where to find my attachment issues. I know where to find my abandonment issues. I know where I've put my porn addiction. The 26 years that I've been a believer in Jesus Christ, 24 of those 26 years, I've had some form of counseling and or therapy. For one reason and one reason only, I don't want anything in my bags ruining the relationships I have with God, my wife and kids, my family, and my friends. This is, this is one of those messages that, that if you receive it, you'll have to do some hard work. Most people don't unpack their bags for one reason and one reason only. It's hard. Especially if you've, you've, you've been traumatized, like I've been traumatized, or if you've gone through a, a, a bad, painful relationship, or you've had your trust abused, you've, you, you've, you've been manipulated, you were gaslighted, whatever you might have gone through, it, it, it makes you very, very reluctant to do it again. But I'm telling you, you don't want to be a prisoner to the things in your bags. You want to be so self-aware that whatever relationship you get into, you get to walk up and say, hey, hi, I'm Tim, and I've been traumatized. <laughs> if you decide to get with me, and I think you should, there's a couple of things you should know. And then you go on that long list, like the people that do the medic, the, the, you know those, um, those commercials where they come out with a medicine, and like the precaution and the warnings is longer than the benefits? <laughs> It's like, hey, would you like to stop a nosebleed? Take this medication. Your liver might fall out. Your brain might completely hemorrhage. Your toenails will turn a funky purple. But your nose will stop bleeding. If you don't know you, don't expect anybody else to. Ooh, that thing. Mm. I felt that. That was, thank you, Holy Spirit. That is not in my notes. Well, listen, ain't nothing in my notes. I just literally go off of what the Lord tells me to do. I'm going to show you what, I'm gonna show you what these notes look like, then we're going to leave. <laughs> these notes are here, literally. That's scripture. These are the notes. I don't know you. The Holy Spirit does. And he knows exactly what to say to you. To get you where you need to be. So, unpack your bags. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? This probably has stirred up some stuff. Maybe your heart rate elevated on certain parts of what I said. If you're in a relationship, maybe you got really, really self-conscious because you're like, oh, snap, I hope my spouse don't look at me. I'm telling you, this is, this is one to grow on. The relationship you have with God will be better. The relationship you have with others will be better. The relationship you have with you will be better. So Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would take these words and these practical points and that you would give us a new perspective on our baggage. May we always understand that we will have bags, but may our bags never have us. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. Bye. Come on, can we just honor Pastor Tim Ross, the word he brought? Come on. So good. Thank you, sir. Everybody just remain seated for just a moment, just in reverence of this moment. With every eye closed, just for a moment, 
talks about unpacking bags and sorting through your stuff. With every eye closed just for a moment, if you're here today and you say, Daniel, Jackie, and I needed this word, and the truth is I felt the Spirit of God stirring in me all throughout that I'm in need of a Savior, the only one that can really heal me and restore me and fix and put stitches where I've been placing Band-Aids, the one that can free me up to be able to have the willingness to unpack these type of bags. The truth is it's Jesus. The answer begins with and ends with Him. So with every eye closed, I'm gonna give you two off opportunities, two invitations today. The first one is Daniel. I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to for the very first time, or maybe you're the second invitation. You say, the truth is, I used to walk with Jesus, but I fell away. I got caught up in the prodigal life. The truth is, I've even added more to the baggage of my life, but I want to fall back in love with Jesus. I want to come back and rededicate my life today to Him today. I'm gonna to count to three. We don't pray prayers for symbolic reasons or just to pray them, but we pray according to Romans 10, verse nine and 10, it says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. Slate wiped clean, throws your sins as far from the east as the west, writes victory in your story. One, today, Daniel, Jackie, I wanna give my life to Jesus for the first time. Two, you're talking about me, I wanna rededicate my life at Woodlands, at Katy, right here at West Houston. If you're watching online, just say yes and our team will help you, our moderators will help you. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. Today's my day, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. Come on, I see you all the way back there. Come on, let's make some noise. A bunch of people said today's my day, today's the day.